Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to New Zor Education. Uh, today we will talk about Newton's three laws, which are basically the, the most fundamental laws of classical mechanics. This is the heart of the classical mechanics. I mean, probably all the problems related uh, to any kind of motion are based on these three laws. Now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics 14. It's presented on unisor.com. Um, on the same website, you have Math 14, which is actually a prerequisite for this course. Especially important are topics like vectors and calculus in Math 14s. Um, so I do suggest you to um, brush up your um, mathematics. This course heavily depends on it. Um, also, the website is completely free. There are no advertisements, so I do recommend you to watch this lecture from this website as well, and ev any other lecture, because there are very detailed comments um, to every lecture. All right, so let's talk about three laws. Well, first of all, these are the laws which are um, relate to each other the main concepts of mechanics motion most likely the first one and obviously the the cause of the motion which we are uh, calling the force now the connection between the force and acceleration um, and and the mass was presented in the previous lecture so these concepts were introduced now this lecture is about their quantitative relationship especially the second law of Newton. Now, a couple of things which should be uh, probably said before everything else. These laws, they are axioms, so to speak, in physics. I mean, in physics we don't really like to use the word axiom, it's a mathematical word, but uh, we basically take them without any kind of a proof except experimental proof. So, there are certain experiments which show that these laws are actually true. And that's kind of sufficient within the framework of our experiments, within uh, the precision which uh, we are making these, conducting these experiments. So, basically, there are no proofs of these laws. However, there are certain considerations which I'm going into um, which kind of prompt that these are these laws do make sense. All right. The second uh, very important thing is that all these laws are true in the inertial uh, frame of reference. Now there are um, well there are no absolutely inertial frames of reference as we know, but we have mentioned before frames of reference systems of coordinates which are related to stars, which are so far away that seem to be immovable. Uh, so there is, for instance, uh, a heliocentric uh, frame of reference where the origin of coordinates is um, at Sun and the axes are directed to stars. There is a geocentric system which is basically rooted um, uh, in our planet um, and again the axes are related to stars and uh, there is a much more I would say common frame of reference which is related to the ground where we stand um, and uh, for certain purposes we're using one or another system of coordinates in most of the um, very simple experiments which we will be talking about, uh, the ground-based system is sufficient um, to be called inertial. I mean, it's not inertial because the Earth is rotating, obviously, but within the framework which we need, within the precision which we are um, uh, talking about, it's sufficiently inertial system. So anyway, in theory, three laws are uh, only uh, true in the inertial uh, frame of reference. Okay, another um, mm, very important aspect of this 
in most of the cases when we are talking about objects we are um, talking about point objects which means the object is infinitely small so whenever we are talking about trajectory we are talking about trajectory of the point of the point object and sometimes we will um, omit the word point we'll just talk about objects but we really uh, have in mind that the object is infinitely small so its coordinates is basically a coordinate of the point in three-dimensional world all right now the first law um, is basically something which we are already familiar with it's the law of inertia so the law of inertia is the first Newton's law and as we know the law of inertia is that an object um, in the inertial system of reference uh, continues its uh, state of rest or uniform motion with constant velocity vector um, unless um, some unbalanced forces um, are applied to this object let's not talked about a lot about what is balanced forces non-balanced forces you just consider it this way if the object uh, has certain forces applied to it and they're not balanced then the object will change the velocity and if the object does not change the velocity it means there are no unbalanced forces all right we'll talk about balancing of the forces a little bit further down um, that would be when certain forces are aggregate together as vectors but that's a separate story okay so that's the first law I mean there is nothing to talk about we have already discussed it many times that's the law of inertia and we all are familiar with this now the second law is basically the law uh, of, of mechanics it uh, quantitatively connects three very important uh, characteristics related to motion the force the mass and acceleration well first of all let me just add one thing these are vectors that's number one acceleration is as we know a second derivative from the position function position function in the in the Cartesian uh, system of coordinate is basically three functions so this is a vector which depends on time and this is the position vector now the first derivative would be the velocity vector when you have derivative here here and here and the second derivative when you have um, uh, double prime here double prime and double prime here that would be my vector of acceleration all right so let's talk about this particular thing now to make my life a little bit easier I will not talk about vectors and I will talk about movement within a straight line that's just easier whenever we're talking about real three-dimensional movement it's exactly the same but instead of just an x coordinate you will have x y and z so uh, at the very end I will probably do some kind of a talking about this but basically right now let's consider that we are talking about the straight line movement and if it's a straight line then acceleration is basically the second derivative of uh, x coordinate and the force is directed again um, uh, ac uh, along this straight line now to make some kind of a quantitative uh, equation we need to know how to measure how to measure acceleration and that we do know because acceleration is the second derivative of the coordinate function coordinate function is a length it's a distance right so distance is measured in meters uh, per time uh, that's the first derivative is meter per time uh, per second and the, the second derivative is meter per second per second right so this is a known unit it's one meter per second square which means that during one second 
the velocity will change by one meter per second. Let's say if it was 40 minutes, uh, meters, meters, not minutes, 40 meters per second, after one second it will be 41 meters per second. That's what the change is, which dictates the um, uh, acceleration of one meter per second, square. But talking about mass and force. Now, in the previous lecture, I have introduced the unit of mass, which is one kilogram, and unit of force, which is one newton. Now, <coughs> what we were talking about, and let me just repeat from the previous lecture, one kilogram was chosen basically arbitrarily. It's some kind of a cylinder made of uh, platinum and uh, iridium alloy, which approximately weighs as much as the cubical decimeter of water, and that's what we just call a kilogram. Now, fine, that's okay. Now, what is one newton? Well, one newton is the force which, if applied to one kilogram, will give one meter per second square acceleration. Now, if there are no force, then acceleration is zero, right? That's inertial system, and there is a law of inertia. But if there is a force, then it's supposed to be basically measured in these units. So basically what I'm saying is that Newton is equal to kilogram meter per second square. That's what I'm actually talking about. It's one kilogram, one meter per second square. And that's how we basically defined the units. So. In case we are talking about the force of one unit uh, of one uh, newton, the uh, mass, the me measure of inertia, so to speak, one kilogram, and the acceleration is one meter per second square because that's exactly how we defined our uh, unit called newton. Then this particular equation. Base. It, well, it, 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 it's true, right? 1 is equal to 1 times 1. There is no problem with this. Now, okay, let's go a little bit further. I also suggested the methodology how we can measure any mass, any object. Well, I said that if my force of 1 newton applied to mass uh, mass kilogram it's supposed to be uh, it's supposed to give acceleration 1 over m meters per second square so that's how I defined uh, mass of m kilogram now I know what 1 newton is so I know this force this is the force which I have once established, it's one kilogram uh, mass being pushed with the acceleration one meter per second. Now, if exactly the same force gives me this type of acceleration, then my mass is m. Or, if you wish, we can do it slightly different. If it gives me acceleration a, then the mass is one over a which is exactly the same thing. Now, why is inverse proportional? Because mass is the measure of inertia. Inertia is a resistance of the movement, which means if the movement is greater, it means my resistance should be less. And that's why A is in the denominator. So that's how I defined. Again, this is a definition. So if I want to know how much uh, what, what is the, the mass of a particular object, I will apply the force of one newton, which I know already how to get it. I will apply the force of one newton. I will measure my acceleration, and I will take the one over that value and say that this is the mass. And again, this is kind of a, a definition of the measure of the, of the mass, right? So it's definition. And again, the same equation is true. 1 is equal to 1 over a times 1 times times a. We exactly 
chose, we, we have exactly chosen this particular measurement style to preserve this equation, right? Now, so we know how to measure any, uh, the mass of any object, right? We just measure it against the one Newton force and check the acceleration and reverse the value. Now, what if I want to measure the, uh, the force? Well, very easily. I will take one kilogram and measure acceleration. And I said that this same value A would be the measure in Newtons of my force. And again, it's chosen exactly to preserve this uh, particular equation. So, this thing basically follows from definition, at least for these simple cases. Now, what if it's just a general case? Any mass and any force and any acceleration, will this be actually held? Well, let's uh, just um, go back to experiments. Well, first of, all, first of all, experiments do show that this is right, not only in these simple cases, but in any case. Because since now we can measure the mass and we can measure the force, we can always combine a new mass and know what, what exactly the value of this mass by doing this, applying the force of one newton. We can then, then take any kind of a force and we can measure the force by applying it to one kilogram and see what kind of an acceleration we have. So that's how we measure the force. What if, if, I, what if, if I apply some force to some mass? What will be the acceleration? And it's supposed to be this way. It's also based on the uh, property of additivity. Now, my mass is additive, which means that if you have one particular object of mass M M1 and another object of mass M2, then combined together into one object, it will be a new object of mass M1 plus M2. So M2 is a real, I mean M1 and M2 are measures which are additive to each other. It's the same thing as, uh, let's say, area. If you have an area of this figure and area of this figure, then the area of a combined figure will be this plus this. Or if you have some other characteristics, like lengths or whatever else. Now, from this additiveness follows that increasing the mass by certain numerical factor um, without changing the force will decrease my uh, acceleration. That's what it basically means, right? And uh, increasing the force without changing the mass will increase the acceleration, right? So basically from this, from this proportionality of the force and uh, acceleration, so let me just write it down this way. So the force is proportional to acceleration. The mass is inverse proportional to acceleration, right? So what I will do is, in this particular equation, I will increase the mass by factor of m. What will I have? Well, my acceleration, uh, kilogram. My acceleration would diminish, right? Uh, meters per second. Because if my mass is increase, my inertia increase, and that's why my acceleration should decrease. So I would still have this Newton. Okay, now, what if I will increase the force now by the fa factor of m? I will, again, increasing the force will increase the acceleration. So, m newtons here, m kilograms here, and m times greater than this would be one meter per second. Okay. Let me now increase the force again by the factor of A. That will increase acceleration by factor of A.
So what happens if I will take a, uh, a, an object uh, of the mass m and I know that this object travels <coughs> with acceleration a, the force must be the multiplication of m, by a, 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 m times a, which is basically this. So it's not really a proof like strictly speaking it's not a rigorous proof of this formula there is no proof we are basically we are taking it as as, as as given as an axiom because there are experiments etc but th this is kind of a natural explanation of how actually we came to to this formula it it it, it comes from the consideration of proportionality between force and acceleration and inverse proportionality between mass and acceleration and these proportionalities we, we, we actually borrowed from definition because in the, fir in, in, in the very first um, place we have defined mass like this one we defined the, the mass of m as something which gives acceleration of 1 over m so we axiomatized the inverse proportionality between mass and acceleration and similarly we, we, we axiomatized the direct proportionality between force and acceleration and from there we derive this particular uh, equation of course if if mass is inverse proportional to a and f is proportional to a we must have the formula like this obvious right so i have spent all this time just to explain that the formula really makes sense now i would like to go back to my vectors so now it's three-dimensional case and I think you should just understand that this is true because A is actually X of T, Y of T, and Z of T. Now F also has um, uh, three components. It's a vector, right? So it's Fx of T, Fy of T, Ffz of T these are three components of the vector and what i'm saying is times m so these three components and these three components of acceleration and the force correspondingly they are related which is actually a system of three differential equations of the second order because what it means is f of x of t is equal to m times d2 x of t d t square and same thing for y and same thing for z so each one is a differential equation of the second order so i mean you 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 might not actually think about this formula f is equal to m a in these terms but it is that's what exactly it is in the most general sense and the only thing which i would like to have more than that is um well two things number one is a very simple one the first law actually can be derived from the second newton's law why if f is equal to m times a if f is equal to zero no force or forces are balanced together then a must be equal to zero now a is the second derivative which is derivative from derivative derivative uh, of uh, uh, position is velocity so a is actually velocity this is vector this is also a vector so a is a, a, a derivative of the velocity vector derivative all, all, all three components so this is something which has a derivative equal to zero so this is constant so velocity is constant if v uh, if derivative of v is equal to zero then velocity is, is constant and that's exactly what, what the law of inertia says that in the absence of forces velocity is constant maybe zero in which case it's at rest and the third law the third law is uh, not really quantitative it's more qualitative it says that if there are two objects and if one object acts against another then that other acts against the first one always and not only just that the forces are equal in magnitude 
and inversely uh, uh, and direct it into opposite direction. So if I have a table and I have some kind of an object on this table, object pushes down acting on the table, but able uh, the table uh, pushes back up towards the object. Now, here you have to really be very careful. Just talking like I was just talking, you can have an impression that these two forces are balancing each other and that's why the object is not moving on the table. That's not true. Because this force is applied by the object to the table. So the table is a recipient of the force, so to speak. This force is uh, how table reacts to the object, in which case object is recipient to the force. So the application of these two forces is different. One force is applied against the table, another force is applied against uh, the object on the table. And they cannot be combined. Only forces which are applied to the same point can be combined together into some kind of a resultant force. Not the forces which are applied to, the, to, the, to two different objects. They cannot balance each other by definition. So why is the object then not moving? Well, because it's not these two forces only which are involved. There is also, in this particular case, force which is called gravity. So the gravity is how Earth pulls down this object. Now, this force, the gravity force, and this force, which is reaction of the table, these two forces are actually applied against object. Table is pushing the object up, gravity pushes the object down. And they're uh, equal in uh, magnitude and oppositely directed, and that's why object does not move, because these two forces balance each other. Now, what about the table? I'm pushing down onto the table. Object weighs something, right? So it pushes down because it has weight. This gravity takes the object down, and object pushes the table with the same uh, uh, force, right? And table is not moving. Why? Well, because there is a floor. So, what's going down onto the floor? The weight of the table, which is gravity, and the weight of the object, which is also gravity, but the floor reacts back with the same force. So, these forces are balancing each other. So, we always have something which is balancing another if, if the object doesn't really move. So, if, if this particular marker is not moving, it means that the weight, its gravity force, which pulls down, is equivalent and oppositely directed to my support, which I am basically pushing forward, pushing upwards, this particular marker. So that's very important to know which exactly is the point of application of the force. And don't mix together the action and reaction, because they are directed at the, they are applied to different uh, to different points but the gravity for instance and reaction are applied to the same thing and that's why they can be uh, combined together and they are equal in magnitude and uh, opposite in direction so that's basically the third law of Newton in details and that's it that's all I wanted to talk about today I suggest you to go to the website and read the notes for this lecture they are more maybe more detailed in some in some cases than whatever i have suggested right now okay thanks very much and good luck <laughs>